are you yes are you we are it? recording and we are uh, everyone is in sir we can start okay all right um a very good morning good afternoon good evening and good night uh, to all of you uh, welcome to the 31st of our series of uh, webinars or the international panel discussion webinars that the department of education of the unesco chair in bioethics has been um, organizing uh, as part of our bringing together all the various disciplines and all uh, and beyond in in the area of uh, dealing or managing or combating a uh, pandemic that is currently the whole world is dealing with and uh, this is part of our solidarity uh, part of the important aspect of solidarity and cooperation which is article 13 of the universal declaration on bioethics and human rights i'm delighted to welcome all of you here and i'm going to uh, before i introduce uh, our very distinguished panel um, of um, experts from the pharmacy discipline from around the world i'm going to ask uh, my co-chair professor mary matthew to also welcome all on behalf of our, our chair we want to particularly have a special welcome to professor amnon kami who is the head and chair of the unesco chair in bioethics who joins us uh, today for this important um, deliberation if all of you might know that we had two uh, webinars where we discussed what was happening in many parts of the world in terms of pharmacy and the important role that pharmacy is playing now in both ma managing uh, patients in the hospitals as well as in the community and uh, and the ethical issues that have played out particularly in 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 our situ in the situation where we currently have no pro uh, um, uh, accepted medication but a lot of anecdotal evidence of of different treatments and so forth which then of uh, the pharmacy discipline has to contain from the ethical aspect. So we discussed these things. And today we're going to introduce um, some of the new, uh, some of the other parts of the world, of the co continents and regions who were not there last, uh, last time. And so we'll get an idea of that. But before all that, uh, our plan is to, uh, to have an ex uh, a, a, explain and take you through the guidelines that were prepared by the expert panel and we'll, we'll, we'll tell you all about that after I, I ask my, my co-chair to also welcome everyone. Over to you, Professor Matthew, Mary. Uh, thank you, Professor Russell, and uh, uh, good day to all our participants it's, uh, and our panelists. Uh, it's lovely to see all of you back again. A lot has happened in the few months that we first met. We were talking about vaccines and hopeful about the vaccines at that point when we made uh, we were we made the guidelines. But uh, we have moved now and we are seeing a new phase uh, where uh, pharmacy practice is has become uh, a very important uh, aspect of this pandemic. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Mahindra Patel, who's not here. He had uh, some personal issues, so he was not able to join us, who was the co-convener. And of course, uh, Professor Henry, thank you very much for taking um, all the pains to, form, uh, to put out the guidelines and what we discussed uh, in the last meeting. And of course, to uh, Dr. Richard also. And, uh, uh, today, what we are going to do is we'll have uh, Professor Henry uh, take us through what we had discussed previously, and then uh, Professor Richard can give us a short presentation on the guidelines, and then we will invite all our new panelists to contribute uh, to what has been discussed so far, and uh, probably we may have to modify um, some of uh, what we had discussed uh, 
uh, the last time. So uh, welcome everybody. And as usual, please um, uh, to all our panelists and to the participants, please uh, use the chat box to uh, discuss. And even uh, if any of the panelists has any literature or links to be put uh, in the, uh, that the participants should be aware of, please uh, feel free to do so. And also the, the part to the participants, uh, please put your questions so that uh, our um, uh, Dr. Derek, who's the moderator of the chat box will uh, take the questions at the end. And with that, I'll hand it over back to uh, Dr. Russell. Thank you. Uh, 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 Professor Derek, uh, do you want to uh, do you want to say anything before? No, just it's good to have everyone back. And just a reminder, there is a YouTube live link streaming of this webinar, which I have already posted. So you can copy and forward that maybe on WhatsApp or any of the other instant messaging to your friends and colleagues who may not be able to log in through Zoom, uh, and they can immediately watch this webinar as it unfolds. Not only that, this link will also be available as a recording subsequently on YouTube, so you can watch it or download it uh, later. And, and thank also you. Back from, to you, Dr. Rasul. Yeah, thank you very much, Derek. One of the things that I found is um, many uh, of my colleagues and others have taken the YouTube, again, when they want to refer it back or show it to their students or to others, they have used, they've told me that they've used the YouTube. That's why we are using the YouTube. Um, uh, so that even if they were not here, they can, you can still access it for your other meetings or for your other, uh, in your universities or institutes or wherever. Okay, so let me now... Um, have the honor of uh, of introducing to you our very distinguished panel uh, of um, experts from the discipline of pharmacy from around the world. We'll start with uh, Professor Henry Menesi, who Jr., who is the Dean of Pharmacy at the University of Illinois in Chicago, USA. And he is the expert chair of, this of the expert committee that put together the, the ethical guidelines. And we're going to talk more about that. We then have um, um, uh, here, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Richa Daramani. She is the principal of the Kaitia College of Pharmacy in, in uh, Gujarat in India. And she is the secretary of the of this uh, committee. So um, I introduce her to you and she'll be also presenting the guidelines short in, in after Dr. After Professor Henry speaks. And then let, let me now uh, take uh, Professor uh, Timothy Chen is uh, the professor from University, Sydney University in, uh, in Australia. And um, he was in, our, in the panel and he has been on this uh, a part of the uh, program, giving the um, contributing to this um, guidelines. And then we have Professor Sailendra Saraf. Now Sailendra Saraf has an important role. He heads, he's the vice chancellor of uh, this, the uh, Duluk University, but he's also the vice president of the Pharmacy Council of India. And he heads the uh, sir, probably like four, pharmacy four, uh, ethics numbers only program of the expert chair time. in India. Um, so, Sailendra, uh, uh, welcome to you, Professor Sailendra, sir. And uh, I will then now introduce to you uh, Professor Ian Wong. Ian Wong is the head of pharmacy at the Hong Kong uh, University of Hong Kong in Hong Kong. Um, and I'll have uh, Dr. Daniela Munhe, who is the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. A welcome to you, uh, Dr. Daniela. And I'm also delighted to introduce to you Professor Rosin O'Hare, who 
comes to us from Belfast in Northern Ireland, and she is the president of the Guild of Healthcare Pharmacists of Ireland. Um, welcome, uh, Rosin, Professor Rosin. And uh, we'll have uh, to, I will introduce to you uh, Diego, Professor Dr. Diego Sousa Martin, who is from Brazil. Uh, and uh, I think uh, he's from the university. Is that right, uh, Professor Diego? Uh, from Federal University of Sao Paulo. Uh, he's from the University of Sao Paulo. One of the big universities there, and he yeah. So he represents. Uh, uh, we have um, Brazil. So these were the new, uh, uh, and of course we have uh, Des Cahill. Professor Des Cahill is from Melbourne. He is from the RMIT, but uh, uh, he is part of the Melbourne unit of the UNESCO chair, and uh, will does the. Uh, executive summary of what happened, so he's part of our team that were, is here. Okay, so now uh, uh, with this uh, distinguished international panel from all over the world, as you can see, uh, we have now come together uh, with, with the important role of bioethics, uh, ethical issues, bioethical issues faced by the pharmacy discipline in hospital and community management, particularly in the COVID uh, pandemic from all the worlds. And with this, we go on to discuss the international guidelines, ethical guidelines that have been developed. So now I'm going to, into, uh, to invite uh, Professor Henry Minisi Jr., who, as I said, is the dean, but more importantly, he's also uh, the uh, chair of the expert international expert panel who put the guidelines. And I'm going to um, invite Henry to address all of you. Over well, to you, day, uh, Henry. Esteemed colleagues, uh, and before I get into my summary, let me make uh, just a, a couple of corrections. Um, the University of Illinois at Chicago only has one dean, and it's not me. Uh, I retired some years ago from uh, in the deanship. Uh, in fact, I spent, after the deanship, I spent 17 years as the chief executive officer of the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, the organization that represents about 50,000 pharmacists practicing in hospitals in the United States. Uh, after my retirement, uh, I returned to Chicago and I serve as a professor uh, at the university and still am involved in uh, some of the academic programs there. Uh, let me also apologize in advance. Uh, for me, the day is just beginning and uh, I have another obligation in about two and a half hours. So I will uh, need to leave the discussion about 7.30 my time. So Tim, 7.30 plus 16 hours, give you an indication as to uh, when I need to, uh, to leave the call. Uh, I also want to recognize uh, two people uh, that are with us this morning, Dr. Richa and Dr. Chen, who served actually on uh, the writing panel. So uh, I want to thank uh, both of those individuals for their uh, several contributions as we develop uh, our written document. Uh, and based on my earlier discussion with uh, Dr. Russell, uh, I will divide my presentation into two pieces. Uh, one to talk a little bit about our work since the uh, July 13th webinar, and uh, then to update you uh, with regard to what's going on, at least as far as uh, yesterday, uh, here in the United States. So uh, I think it goes without saying that our meeting today is a, a historic moment. Uh, we're on the cusp of bringing vaccines to our respective populations, uh, vaccines that have been developed in record time with uh, intriguing science that uh, 
we've not seen broad applications until uh, this particular time. So I think we all uh, wait with great anticipation about the ethical distribution and the utilization of vaccines to begin to uh, bring control to this horrible pandemic. Uh, it's also a time when there are real and planned opportunities for all in the profession of pharmacy. And I mean all. Uh, yes, community and hospitals, but our partners in industry, our partners in government, our par partners in some of the non-traditional areas where pharmacists are working. I think we, uh, we all have a, a wonderful opportunity to join in this global effort to getting vaccines from the manufacturers and into the arms of everyone in the world. Uh, I think as we recognized uh, in our earlier discussion that as we move into this world of pharmacy engagement and uh, seeking solutions to the pandemic, that we must do our work in a framework of ethical values and uh, principles and uh, certain understandings uh, around morality. And uh, this is, a, I think, a very important tradition that has been brought to us by uh, the United Nations and the United Nations agencies, and specifically UNESCO uh, through its chair on bioethics. So after our discussion, extensive discussion uh, that we had in July, uh, there was, I think, a unanimous call to begin to capture some of the issues and questions from an ethical perspective that uh, we as a profession in pharmacy need to be cognizant of and apply to some of our decision-making at various levels. And uh, my hope is that you've had an opportunity to uh, at least cursorily read what has been developed to date and uh, that uh, it can serve as a foundation for more extensive discussions uh, certainly here at the panel, but I think if, if we had a dream, we would like to see every pharmacy organization, every pharmacy school, every gathering of pharmacists use this particular document as a uh, basis for discussion and uh, certainly developing actions in their respective countries around uh, getting rid of this pandemic through uh, public health practices as well as uh, utilization of the vaccine. So uh, at least from uh, the perspective of the panel, uh, we hope that the document will be reproduced and uh, be made available very broadly and that our colleagues throughout the world uh, can see this as a useful instrument to stimulate dialogue and uh, maybe even ask questions that we haven't even posed yet. Uh, I don't think the document is meant as a last word on ethical principles in pharmacy related to the pandemic, but I think it uh, is comprehensive enough that it would be a good start for widespread dialogue. And you'll see that in terms of the organization of that document, uh, we started with uh, some key ethical principles, and these were derived from uh, dialogue and literature uh, in the bioethics community. And uh, I think we purposefully began with those principles and explained those principles and uh, used some translation to their application to pharmacy. We uh, also used uh, the framework of the medication use process. That is the continuum of making a decision about a patient needs medicine all the way through the preparation of those medicines, the utilization of those medicines, and then the pharmacovigilance and monitoring that needs to go on uh, when patients use medicines. And I think that framework we try to use as a basis for identifying some ethical issues in all of those uh, particular subsections of the medication use process. 
We also looked at the continuum of drug development from drug discovery through various governmental processes that newly discovered drugs are moved through in order to determine their safety and their efficacy and their capacity for utility in the broader population. Uh, ending, of course, in uh, pharmacovigilance and post-marketing surveillance relating to adverse events and safety signals that oftentimes, as many as 20 years later, don't begin to appear, but we need to pay attention to those signals. Uh, you'll also note that rather than being redundant and discover our own uh, concepts around priorities uh, as to who should be getting the vaccines and in what order, uh, we use the work of the United States Academy of uh, Medicine, National Academy of Medicine. Uh, this is an esteemed organization in the United States, uh, an authoritative organization who coupled with the Centers for Disease Control and the United States Food and Drug Administration uh, developed a uh, timeline of priorities. And uh, that timeline uh, has stood. In fact, it was affirmed uh, just two days ago by the Centers for Disease Control in the US. And uh, I believe it's now serving as the foundation for establishing priorities as to who should be getting the vaccine. So my hope is that uh, you'll uh, take this document seriously. You'll take it to your colleagues, distribute it widely. Uh, there is some discussion between uh, Dr. Souza and uh, Dr. Duggan at the International Pharmaceutical Federation uh, about getting their assistance uh, in duplicating and replicating this document. Uh, and uh, getting it distributed around the world. So having said that, uh, I do want to share with you and hopefully it will help uh, sort of focus some of the issues in our discussion uh, as to what is happening uh, in the United States. And uh, if you are paying attention to what's going on in the United States, uh, you'll notice that uh, it is among the highest in the world in incidence and prevalence and death rate. We are approaching 300,000 deaths, uh, probably by today or tomorrow. Uh, the prediction is that under current circumstances, we likely by the end of the year might hit 400,000 deaths. This has become uh, a very tragic and uh, serious situ situation. And, uh, I hate to say it about my own country, uh, but there has been regrettable, I underscore regrettable politicization of uh, the pandemic. And as a consequence, uh, we are seeing uh, rather inconsistent application of basic health practices and uh, fundamentals to dealing with uh, infectious disease, such as wearing masks and social distancing sanitizing, traveling, gathering, uh, and it has allowed for uh, a very efficient transmission of this organism. And I use that term efficient. I recently learned it actually from Dr. Fauci. Uh, he made a comment recently that uh, this organism is extremely efficient in transmitting itself and uh, finding its way into the bodies of people who have been infected. infected. Uh, it's also uh, quite evident that we are beginning to experience a surge in cases as well as uh, hospitalizations consequent to the Thanksgiving holidays. This is a very important holiday in the US when families get together all over the world. And uh, there was a rather extensive uh, number of people who traveled in public transportation of all sorts and gathered with their families. And we are now seeing the surge results of that. Uh, the difficulty that we face now, and again, uh, using Dr. Fauci's terminology, we will begin to witness probably in another two or three weeks, a uh, surge upon surge 
because given all of the major religions, uh, there are about 40 holidays between now and the beginning of the year where families will be getting together and uh, perhaps uh, individuals who don't know each other will be getting together. And uh, we're uh, from a more pessimistic perspective looking at another uh, surge on top of the surge. Uh, we are witnessing a rather uh, significant strain on hospitals and health systems as a whole. And reports are coming out that a number of parts of the country are at full capacity. Uh, quite frankly, having worked in America's healthcare system for over 50 years, uh, I certainly have never experienced anything like that, even with dastardly uh, public health problems, we've really never seen uh, a great concern about do we have enough beds in the intensive care units? Do we have enough staff to man these units, uh, et cetera? But the good news uh, is that um, the profession of pharmacy is poised to be a substantial and significant player in uh, certainly in the vaccination scheme. Uh, but also working with our colleagues in medicine and looking at therapeutic issues from a uh, efficacy and safety perspective, but also from cost effectiveness perspectives and post-marketing surveillance perspectives. The uh, federal government has acquired the vaccine and has implemented a uh, supply chain scheme utilizing the United States Army. The United States Army will be tasked with uh, getting the vaccine from the manufacturers and uh, delivering it to the states. The 50 states in turn have developed their own plans for uh, not only prioritization, but also for disseminating the vaccines to uh, its various communities. And for those of you who may have traveled in the US, like most of your countries, we of course have the challenges of uh, rural communities, challenges of very distant communities uh, over difficult terrains like mountains. Uh, and of course we have uh, the challenges of overcoming some of the anti-vaxxer attitudes about the utilization of vaccines. So we'll get back the, um, Centers for Disease Control and the National Academy of Medicine have developed a priority phasing plan uh, with frontline healthcare workers as the first priority. And in fact, uh, in my own city in Chicago, uh, the news has been full of uh, the readiness of uh, most of the 40 hospitals in the Chicago area to begin immunization of frontline healthcare workers starting on Monday. And in fact, one of the hospitals said uh, their target is a thousand immunizations per day, depending of course on the allocation of how much vaccine they receive. Uh, the current vaccine that has been approved, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, requires storage at minus 70 centigrade. Uh, so part of the distribution has been tied to the capacity of institutions having freezers that can freeze this vaccine at that temperature. Uh, apparently uh, dry ice, frozen form of carbon dioxide can also get you there, but nonetheless, uh, that's becoming a factor with this particular vaccine. And I think the hope is that in subsequent vaccines, uh, I think the Moderna vaccine also requires that uh, low freezer, ultra freezing storage, but that the AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson vaccines uh, apparently need just uh, normal uh, refrigeration. This is a, a huge challenge and will be a huge challenge uh, throughout the world. Um, many hospitals and many community-based clinics have plans to utilize pharmacists as immunizers. We have about 360,000 pharmacists and pharmacy technicians who have been trained and certified for uh, giving vaccinations. 
and all of the states uh, allow pharmacists to uh, give immunizations and that has been fortified <clears throat> by both federal and state proclamations expanding the scope of practice of pharmacists to include now uh, the immunization of patients. Uh, another interesting factor is the second tier of priorities is uh, residents, elder residents in assisted living facilities. And uh, the federal government has contracted with all of the major chain pharmacy corporations, many of the grocery stores uh, that have pharmacies in them, and a number of other uh, pharmacy operations to take teams of pharmacists and nurses into assisted living facilities and begin to immunize elderly residents. Uh, these homes, uh, communal living, of course, has exacerbated the transmission of the virus and a uh, significant portion of the deaths that have occurred have occurred in these assisted living facilities. So consequently, uh, these areas are uh, second uh, here now of immunization after frontline healthcare workers. Um, adverse event reporting is required under the uh, current designation for approval. So all of the states have, uh, through their departments of health, established centers for receiving patient, uh, data on uh, adverse events. And of course, that information will flow back to uh, the United States Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control. <clears throat> uh, next week, will uh, give us an indication about how all of these uh, best laid plans will begin to materialize. Uh, as you might imagine, all the news uh, sources are onto this and uh, it, uh, it's been reported everywhere. So I think the healthcare system will be under a, a bit of a microscope as we begin to implement the hope is that the total population would be immunized by the summer of 2021 with a target of 70% of the population being immunized in order to assure uh, herd immunity. Uh, there's obviously a lot of discussion about uh, people who are vaccination hesitant uh, and anti-vaxxers, but uh, from the polling data, it seems that the number of people willing to take the exam uh, is going up. And I suspect that as we see the successes associated with the uh, use of the vaccine, that we will uh, perhaps be able to increase that. So in a nutshell, uh, that's what's going on uh, in the US. Um, the pharmacy community and all of the pharmacy organizations uh, are working together to assure the appropriate utilization. And you'll recall we discussed uh, in our webinar back in July that there needs to be effective and efficient utilization of the pharmacist workforce. Uh, we need the hands and minds of uh, these well-educated people to uh, help administer these vaccines as well as to, uh, to deal with the therapeutics. In the therapeutic area, uh, I don't think anything really is coming out as a silver bullet. Uh, the monoclonal antibodies, the use of uh, high dose steroids, uh, the use of uh, remdesivir doesn't seem to be coming out as the great set of healing therapeutics. But nonetheless, uh, I think that uh, the medical community has come to understand this disease better and uh, that we are seeing uh, people being able to survive uh, this horrid epidemic. So uh, let me stop uh, talking and hopefully uh, what I've said will be a good uh, springboard for our next discussion. And again, uh, thank you, Tim, and thank you, uh, Dr. Risha, uh, for your work with us on the development of our document. Thank you, thank you, Henry, um, uh, for that introduction <coughs> and taking us through uh, what is up to yesterday in the United States of America. 
Now I'm going to ask uh, Risha, Professor Risha, to um, briefly um, give us an overview of the guidelines. And after that, I will go hand it to Professor Mary. Yes, thank you, sir. Is, yeah, one moment. I'll just give, after that, give it back to Mary. And in the end, hopefully, we should, uh, Henry, it's 5.30 in the morning for, for Henry in uh, Chicago. And thank you very much for that. Uh, but I, I, I'm sure we will finish in time for you to attend to your next appointment. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will have you uh, uh, saying, looking at what next. Okay. So, okay, Risha, let, let's, let's get your presentation on the guidelines for the ethical um, uh, practice of uh, the pharmacy in in both community and the hospital. Yes, thank you, sir. First of all, following uh, Dr. Henry's, uh, Professor Henry's uh, words, uh, with his uh, guidance and uh, with the contributions from other uh, eminent uh, co-panelists and uh, members of the International Expert Committee, and of course, uh, with thanks and gratitude to uh, Professor Russell D'Souza along with Dr. Mary Matthew and the entire team of UNESCO uh, Department of Education. Um, I consider it uh, my honor and privilege to be a part of this committee. And uh, without taking much of the time, uh, as all, uh, Dr. Henry has covered most of the aspects of uh, how these guidelines uh, were formulated and uh, uh, how these guidelines are where they are as of now. And uh, in due course of time, after we have uh, the vaccine in a major part of the world, uh, we will uh, we may require certain changes, certain amount of changes. So they are of a dynamic nature. But uh, prima facie, uh, allow me to share the screen so that I can present before you the guidelines, which are in a draft state. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let me introduce the esteemed members of the panel who were involved in uh, uh, in the compilation of all these guidelines. Uh, Professor uh, Timothy Chen from Australia, uh, Dr. Pierre Essa, uh, Professor Dr. Shailendra Saraf, sir, uh, with his uh, blessings and, uh, of course, with the blessings from our president, uh, uh, Dr. B. Suresh sir, who has given us the wonderful platform and uh, given us the opportunity to lead. Uh, Professor Helda Mota Philip, uh, myself, and uh, uh, the entire uh, uh, Dr. Mahendra Patel. I, I'm sorry, I just missed this, but Dr. Mahendra Patel is there uh, as a very important uh, co chair uh, member of this panel, and Dr. Henry Manas sir, uh, who has uh, chaired the entire uh, draft process. The convening authority uh, uh, with uh, inputs from uh, Ms. Maria Eugenia Oliveira and uh, Professor D'Souza and uh, Dr. Mary Matthew. Uh, this, the, the entire uh, team was involved in uh, compilation and putting forth, giving the, a complete structure to these uh, thoughts and, uh, uh, and you know, uh, knitting the principles of bioethics uh, with the pharmacy. So this is one of its kind and uh, I don't think so any uh, material or guidance of such sort is present till date. So the entire guidelines rest on the uh, core ethical principles uh, with respect to the role of pharmacist uh, considering the development and uh, uh, availability of COVID-19 vaccine. So the uh, basic principle of biotechs, that is a non-maleficence that says do no harm. So uh, as a pharmacist, it's a key responsibility to ensure that whatever actions that are involved uh, and uh, involved to assure a safe and effective vaccine are, um, are propagated and any risk on behalf of the patient should be mitigated. So this is the key risk responsibility and uh, it is also important to by the pharmacist to ensure that uh, any off label experimental or uh, you know uh, compassionate use of any vaccine or any drug candidate for this matter for the uh, mitigation and treatment of covid-19 
virus or any such situation thereof is taken care of. The second principle uh, uh, that we have uh, considered is autonomy. That is the respect for the independence of thought, intention, and action. That means uh, by this principle, the patient is empowered to take a decision where, and uh, to present their willingness to be vaccinated or to get engaged in the treatment modality uh, that is based on the medicinal agent. So the entire uh, uh, decision, the onus of the decision uh, rests on the patient and he or she should be given the uh, respect for his decision. So, of course, there are many cases uh, where we see that the patient is an unresponsive or dilemma state and he is not uh, he or she is not in a position to make a decision whether to take the vaccine or not. So at that time, it is a moral responsibility of the pharmacist to uh, help him uh, and uh, make a judicious discussion uh, decision uh, on behalf of the patient. So uh, uh, any sort of personal uh, vested interest or any sort of mon monetary uh, gains or any any other uh, matter for search um, uh, involved uh, in that process uh, should not be uh, given any preference, uh, but for the autonomy for the patient or the, well, the person who wants to take the vaccine or not. Third principle, important principle or core ethical principle is justice. So uh, justice means uh, it inculcates in itself the uh, principle of equality and equity. Uh, equity yeah. So uh, when while distribution and while dispensing of the vaccine, uh, it is also a duty of the pharmacist to apply judicious decision making uh, decision making because uh, we may have uh, you know a condition where not many vaccines are available and maybe uh, uh, there may be different candidates uh, that need to be administered with the vaccine. So all these uh, sort of cases should be evaluated and assessed uh, judiciously and rightfully so that the uh, the principle of equity and equality is maintained the next core principle is uh, beneficence that is intent of striving the net benefit for individual individual involved so whatever the uh, patient or the uh, the vac the receiver of the vaccine uh, his uh, interest or his net benefit should be uh, is the prime uh, you know concern for the pharmacist so since pharmacist is a link between the manufacturer of the vaccine or the regulatory body or the country basically and the patient uh, his primary focus uh, should be uh, you know knitted with the uh, concept of health and healing and uh, any other uh, vested interest or any other uh, pressure or any such uh, sort of uh, you know uh, negligence uh, should not be given any place the uh, next uh, bioethics principle is truthfulness uh, which is uh, which involves uh, in itself the commitment to openness and honesty a pharmacist has to be very open and transparent in all the communications and at the same time utmost level of honesty need to be maintained uh, there are uh, we uh, we see routinely that pharmacists are are uh, you know facing many issues with respect to this uh, core principle but uh, when it comes to covid-19 vaccine since it is uh, in the larger interest of the community uh, the care of the patient by pharmacist must be grounded at all levels so uh, and in any cases when there is a, a conflict or uh, uh, it requires a judgment to be made so uh, it has to be with the due consideration of the previous bioethics core principles um, the last uh, important core principle that we have considered is solidarity. That means all the information um, uh, related to the uh, distribution or relevant data, knowledge, and findings. Because this is uh, this all is very new to the world. Uh, we don't have any such uh, you know fast track or express uh, COVID uh, express vaccine available till date. And we have seen that uh, during the third phase of trials, also the mass production has started in many uh, regions of the world. And uh, thus, uh, this is a very unique and uh, you know exclusive uh, case of uh, 
development of any vaccine and its availability and distribution. So solidarity has to be maintained and it, it holds a very, very important place um, when we consider the principles of bioethics uh, and a pharmacist therefore has an important role to play also. And whenever he or she comes across any information or acquires any knowledge with his practice, he ha or she has to share the relevant data, not with the common public, but with the uh, uh, with the authorities. And uh, uh, no amount of information or no amount of knowledge should be concealed for the personal or vested interests. The major facets of medication use, process, and important applications thereof uh, when it comes to the job areas or the practice areas of a pharmacist. Uh, of course, we all know that uh, all these principles of bioethics would be uh, utilized uh, at one or more places while we are carrying our duties with respect to prescribing, clinical evaluation, preparing and dispensing of vaccines, counseling and ad advising, uh, the patients uh, for the uh, administration of the vaccines and in case of any other, you know, apprehensions or any other development of any uh, some uh, serious adverse events or any adverse reactions or side effects for that matter, then monitoring and pharmacovigilance. Uh, yes, of, that's very important because uh, once the vaccine is administered, then also the pharmacist has to be in contact with the patient and get relevant data and information and report. And uh, last but not the least the supply chain and formulation whoever pharmacists are involved in the supply chain and formulation they have to uh, play they are going to play a very important part because these vaccines require special storage conditions special methodology and specialized procedures for their distribution channel and uh, uh, along with the formulation uh, nuances so it is a, a moral dis responsibility on account of the pharmacist to maintain the utmost uh, you know um, high standards of uh, diligence at all levels. Additional issue areas uh, of consideration that uh, uh, these guidelines comprise of is uh, uh, not with uh, for the uh, on the side of the pharmacist means uh, it is uh, the pharmacist has to consider their own uh, safety uh, when they are working in the areas or environments uh, when they are going into the common public or communities for uh, distribution or uh, you know uh, supply chain management of uh, these vaccines uh, vaccine batches. Uh, triaging of various services offered by the pharmacist involved in different work settings. Uh, so how to, uh, you know, decide uh, judiciously and uh, sensibly uh, uh, the allocation of the vaccines for various uh, communities. Deployment strategies for pharmacists on the field. Uh, how these pharmacists, if, if at all in any part of the world, the pharmacists are involved in the administration of the vaccines. We already know that many parts of the world, uh, the pharmacists are authorized for the immunization and vaccination programs. So what should be the deployment strategies uh, on behalf of the government or the regulatory authorities? Uh, recognition of pharmacists as health service providers by various government and non-government organizations. So a pharmacist, it is high time that pharmacists get their due uh, acknowledgement uh, in the society and as a important uh, part of the healthcare team, the whole link uh, issues with respect to willingness and consent because some pharmacists may not be so they cannot be pressurized. They should not be pressurized rather to uh, you know if they are not willing or if they are not consent to provide their services, then they cannot be pressurized or to do so without any uh, you know. Uh, uh, sensible reasons. Confidentiality issues uh, from the pharmacist uh, in uh, with regards to their relationships with the patients and the other providers should be maintained at all level and this the regulators or the government uh, persons have to ensure that all uh, this confidential uh, confidentiality of the data and information is maintained. Uh, support and availability of special allowances uh, should also be um, uh, given a due, you know, uh, place, uh, including the access to protective equipment when they are going in the communities, they have to take care because we know uh, how much infectious this particular vaccine, uh, this virus is. In case of death or serious injury, what should be the support system that would be available uh, to the pharmacist or th their family uh, uh, in case of any adverse 
you know sort of accident or something happens logistics and transportation of the material means medications and uh, the vaccine units the uh, the packages uh, in a safe and confidential manner and uh, they should be pilfer proof or pilfer evident uh, so such type of mechanisms need to be ensured uh of course leadership and leadership training and development uh, for various roles and organized efforts should be chalked out on behalf of the regulatory persons and senior uh, pharmacist so that uh, all this planning is executed in a zero deficiency manner now uh, these guidelines also uh, incorporate uh, uh, the uh, covid-19 vaccine allocate allocation that was developed and proposed by uh, national academy of medicine in the united states so uh, they have proposed uh, the allocation in four phases so uh, the first phase comprises of the high risk health workers or the first responders and uh, that and the the second phase of the first phase b phase of the first phase uh, uh, older adults and people of all ages uh, come up with comorbidities and underlying conditions uh, or who, those who are significantly at the risk uh, the second phase involved the of course the educators the teachers and the critical workers in high risk conditions and uh, you know uh, people in homeless shelters or uh, people with disabilities uh, prisoners um, and uh, other adults which were not included in the phase 1 the next phase that is phase 3 would comprise of young adults children workers in industries means labor and uh, those who are uh, those are uh, those who are left out are at a higher risk as when they are not involved in the phase 1 and phase 2 means excluded and phase 4 everyone at other person uh, apart from phase 1 phase 2 and phase 3 covered uh, so those would be the uh, phase 4 recipient of the vaccine so uh, the pharmacist uh, have a lot of responsibility to shoulder and lot of uh, scope and opportunity to contribute as an important and uh, vital uh, link or vital uh, you know role player uh, in the whole process so uh, with respect to the formulation or compilation of these guidelines uh, these are the resources that we have utilized and with this uh, uh, i end my presentation uh, for these guidelines uh, that was a team work and uh, and thank you one and all for the patient listening over to dr rasel uh, thank you uh, professor risha I, i just want to inform you all that uh, doc professor dr catherine duggan who should have been here but unfortunately couldn't be here she is the chief executive officer of the international pharmaceutical federation based at netherlands who of course henry had introduced me to her and she is going to uh, following this meeting which uh, we uh, she wants uh, at the end uh, to give a statement and she's going to ensure that this guidelines will be sent to the international to all the international pharmaceutical federations around the world am i right henry she has yes. access to the whole world of, of from the pharmacy is that right that, uh, that's so correct. There, there are about 140 national associations that are members of that federation right so that's very important and i think it's very good that we've been able to put this as rich as said uh, together uh, with and, and now we will go further and i'll hand it to professor mary matthew who will uh, uh, take the moderate and get get the views from the other regions and so forth and take this forward to finally give a a, a call uh, to professor catherine dugan who's going to take this to the world through through the international pharmaceutical federation of the world based at netherlands okay mary over to you dr mary can you hear me yeah um uh, thank you dr rasul my the internet is a little unstable so to all the panelists and uh, uh the participants who are joining in my apologies uh, 
I've just landed home and I'm coming straight for the webinar. Uh, so I'm having issues with my uh, internet. So not to worry, we have able people here who can take over the session. So um, thank you, Professor Henry, for uh, putting out these guidelines, at least taking the lead because um, pharmacy is one, uh, one uh, discipline which has not get, uh, got its due um, uh, when, uh, when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's, it's really amazing and marvelous to know mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yes. sort of lost you a little bit. Doesn't okay? Go ahead. Yeah. So um, it's. I just wanted to tell Professor um, um, Henry that uh, it's really amazing that uh, the pharmacy workforce has been roped in to administer the vaccine, and I would like all the panelists to uh, let us know how um, this process works in each of their countries. I will come to each uh, panelist one by one. But before that, let me thank, because if uh, Professor Henry has to go, I'd really like to thank him for taking this initiative and the cause forward and uh, um, bringing in uh, the guidelines. And of course, to Dr. Uh, Professor Richard and also to Professor Mahindra Patel for um, contributing. And uh, I will now go to Professor Timothy uh, Chen from University of uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Timothy, you're, you're there. Can you hear me? Professor Timothy? Tim, you're on mute. Yep. You Thank you, Mary. Okay. Yeah, uh, Professor Timothy, you've seen the this guidelines come through, and it's really fascinating that it's, you know, we, you were able to, you all as a team were able to get something so comprehensive and so fast. But uh, a lot has changed from June, July when we did the webinar. Would you, uh, are there any other thoughts that you would like to add in, uh, considering we're three, four months uh, past from when we started uh, in terms of Australia? Uh, in terms of Australia, I guess uh, to make some general comments uh, to start with, uh, the COVID-19 cases in Australia have been very well managed in respect of uh, social distancing, using of masks, uh, washing, washing uh, hands. And so uh, the case numbers and death rate in Australia have been very low compared to other parts of the world. Uh, unlike uh, in the US, UK and Canada at the moment, we don't have the vaccines approved by our regulator the Therapeutic Goods Administration uh, in Australia. However, that's anticipated in the first quarter of next year. I think apart from that, I th uh, there's no further updates in relation to the general aspects of the uh, ethics document uh, produced. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Professor uh, Timothy, uh, apparently Australia has already bought uh, enough vaccines for the whole country. And um, uh, they, uh, is there any, uh, is there a rethinking whether uh, a vaccine is really necessary in, uh, uh, among people's minds in Australia? And no, the thinking hasn't changed. And in fact, the government will pay for uh, vaccination for everyone in the yep. uh, country. Uh, it is correct that the government has pre-purchased uh, uh, 50 million or 100 million copies of multiple of the uh, vaccines in preparation uh, for when the uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration of Australia approves these, probably in the first quarter of uh, next year, pending, uh, pending uh, data, and then there'll be a rollout of the vaccination program after that. Is there a prioritization of the vaccine? Has, has the government thought through it? Because uh, um, uh, Professor Henry talked about the National Academy of Science in the United States that has, uh, you know, contributed to uh, uh, the prioritization of the vaccine. Is there uh, anything like that in Australia? 
uh, there will be something very similar to uh, the prioritization which has been outlined in the uh, ethics uh, document. And so the uh, first stage will involve the most vulnerable people and also the uh, healthcare professionals. And especially given the uh, Pfizer vaccine requirements for minus 70 uh, degrees uh, storage, uh, it would be administered via various um, uh, health institutions, hospitals, the major hospitals within the uh, major centres. And, and so uh, I think... But um, are, are the pharmacists, uh, pharmacy workforce called in to administer the vaccine? Uh, well, they haven't administered any uh, COVID vaccines because they're not, uh, they're not uh, approved yet. Currently in Australia, pharmacists can be accredited uh, to administer influenza vaccines, but not, yep. uh, uh, not other vaccinations at the uh, moment. However, I think we will need a, a significant workforce to cross-sectionally administer uh, vaccines, you know, ac ac across the uh, population. So the pharmacy profession indeed is gearing up for uh, playing a significant role in the okay. administration of COVID-19 vaccines. Right. Uh, thank you, Professor Timothy. Uh, uh, Mary, uh, one, one moment, Mary. Like, yes. uh, can I just welcome uh, Professor Pire Effa, who's also a panel Pierre member, he's just joined us. Uh, Professor Pirefa from Cameroon, who's Cameroon. part of this panel, yes. Uh, I just welcome you. Uh, you are part of this. We just mentioned you there. Over to you, uh, uh, Mary, back, back to your program. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Russell. Uh, uh, I wanted to uh, ask Professor uh, Saraf. Professor Saraf is from India. Professor Saraf? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, Professor Saraf, uh, India has already prioritized who the vaccine is supposed to be given. And I think they've already made up their minds, which uh, uh, I don't see on screen, Professor Saraf. Are you there? He's there. We can see him. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, it looks like India has already prioritized who the vaccine is going to. And uh, they have decided on which vaccine because Pfizer and Moderna vaccine require minus to, uh, 80 and minus 20, uh, which may be difficult in terms of administering to the rural areas. So my understanding is that they are going in for uh, probably the Oxford AstraZeneca. Is, uh, what, what is the state uh, uh, right now uh, regarding that, uh, Professor Sarif? Oh, thank you, Dr. Mary, and uh, thanks to Dr. Rashan and uh, all the panelists. So uh, before responding to your question, let me place on record the contribution made by Dr. Rashan for bringing out this uh, beautiful piece of paper. And as uh, suggested by Dr. Henry, uh, the, something will be added after this particular webinar. And I can assure all of you that uh, this paper must be adopted by the Pharmacy Council of India and we are sec a circulating official document to uh, 3000 plus institution across the country. Mm -hmm. So thank you for initiative. Yeah. And uh, one more important thing, because uh, this is uh, the um, ethical uh, guidelines. Uh, it's not specifically uh, uh, for the COVID-19 only. This is general um, uh, guidelines as well. So once it is um, in place, it must be helpful for all the uh, pharmacists working in different uh, places. Few things we have to further um, add in this particular document, rather uh, we have to make some um, changes because um, in a country like India, there is a, some act, prevailing acts which uh, suppress the, uh, the existing rules and regulations in case of pandemic or national emergency. So in India, there is a concept of, um, there's a provision of um, national disaster, disaster management. And under this uh, act, uh, the several uh, clauses and acts are suppressed. So under those conditions, how pharmacists can take the better decision while they have to ensure the ethical values and at the same time, they have to follow the national laws of national uh, disaster management. One most important thing in terms of uh, India and in terms of the, uh, the uh, issue raised by Dr. Henry, Dr. Matthew, uh, that um, uh, uh, the communication is excellent. 
we have the biggest big country and we have diverse uh, uh, nation but still we have observed we have excellent communication with each and every one in this country and the preparedness of the government is like that ki they are not focusing only one or two vaccines they are preparing for all the vaccines whichever comes um, early they will they will uh, supply all all such things even the supply chain they are they are considering to put the um, bar footing label uh, preparation and they are also involving thinking to involve the military um, infrastructure to 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 uh, distribute the um, this uh, vaccine Vaccine. across the country at the same time uh, they they are also the country is also considering to um, to have the um, technology transfer from germany for the uh, production of um, uh, small units for uh, deep freezing and uh, even minus 26 so there is a huge preparation as far as the infrastructure is concerned whichever is successful vaccine which is whichever is available it must be made available to one and all there is another um, uh, this initiative for the government that they are thinking to make the, the, as a part of the national immunization program and uh, they are also okay. going to bear the financial uh, uh, burden also so this is a beautiful example as a country excellent uh, communication and they are keeping track of all the all the all the all the vaccines and this is a, since this is international forum so i would like to mention one important thing the prime minister of the country is going to visit um, the different um, facilities for the production of vaccines this is one of the example how proactive the government is acting in order to make uh, in order to have the um, hand holding with the industry and make these things available to the nation so this is the uh, current affair because uh, they they are they are um, is still not declared which one they are going to use okay. finally finally but they are working in all the on, on all the vaccines and they are preparing this infrastructure across the country and they have communicate they have started communication with different states and they have already instructed to provide the infrastructure aid by the people involve the even retired uh, this healthcare professionals in order to have the massive immunization program for this covid-19 so i i am sure that india is going to set a, a set an example for the world though the, we are we are we are developing country we are huge um, as far as the population is concerned we have diverse culture and diverse uh, we can say um, uh, approaches but still we are going to have this vaccination very fast and effectively as far as information is concerned each and every one is informed through government machinery there are uh, some cases of reluctance so people are not following the guidelines of the uh, national disasters but nobody can say they are not informed so they are, they are well informed so this is also we have to appreciate as well as the country is concerned so i think i have addressed your query dr mary yeah yeah professor sarif it's, really, uh, it's really it's really nice to know that india is including it in the national immunization program so uh, uh, that way everyone is covered Uh, um, will the pharmacy workforce be included in uh, administering the vaccine in india or is it uh, um so, it's going to be the healthcare workers and uh, the you know the asha workers or uh, who work uh, uh, as, as, in the as rural a, areas so far the immunization program pharmacists were not included because uh, there was shortage of the pharmacists uh, earlier but we have now uh, um, a million club of pharmacists so they are sincerely thinking about this but they have not uh, government has not yet come out with the final proposals but i am sure the pharmacists going to play a big role in this immunization process thank you professor sir do you know the list of uh, the order of priority of vaccines the prioritization so, uh, uh, how india has is going to go about uh, prioritizing who's to get so, it first So the first is uh, as um, throughout the world the first is the uh, front uh, front line uh, warriors like uh, healthcare professionals followed by followed by the this um, uh, senior citizens of the country so this is priority but still this fight this is not finalized and not circulated but this okay. is basically throughout the world the same thing is followed in different places and market um, open market will be the second phase as far as the uh, the the news coming out of the discussion from the government forums Okay, so my understanding is first it would probably be uh, the healthcare workers, and then the armies. What I heard, 
and then those above 50 and those less than 50 with comorbid conditions. Uh, yes. Is that the way um, it's going to go? There are two, three proposals. So first is that uh, milit they have military, they have not mentioned as such because this is some military, sort of uh, no. military they have not mentioned. But certainly they will go, but this will be a confidential um, uh, uh, affair. But uh, senior citizens and comorbidity is the priority for, priority. for, the, for the world. The world under the guidelines of the WHO and all other uh, regulatory bodies in the world. Oh, thank more, you very much. One more Sorry. thing, I have, uh, one more thing I would like to place on the card: the, the uh, role of regulatory and pharmacovigilance in this country, because um, they are so quick, they are so vigilant and very fast as far as the approval of the different vaccines is concerned. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Sarah. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Pierre is there because I'd like to get all our uh, previous uh, panelists in and then we can go to our new panelists, our new uh, guest panelists. Is uh, Professor Pierre there? Pierre Effer from Cameroon? Yes, I'm, yes. I'm okay. Uh, good, good on you. Uh, uh, welcome to Pierre. Okay, uh, Professor Pierre, you were there in the uh, uh, last webinar where we discussed about the guidelines. Yes. I hope you had a I'm chance on. to look at it and uh, what a marvelous work. The outcome has been really good. I didn't get you, please. Uh, we had, uh, uh, from the previous webinars, uh, we had uh, Professor Henry and his team with Professor Richa and Professor uh, Mahindra Patel put out certain, uh, put out guidelines. Were you able to look into it? Yeah. Guidelines. He's, he's one of the panelists. On, on yeah, you, you were there, there right? The, you made so, the document that we, the document yes, that we made. That you were, yes, yes, that you were involved in. Yeah. I was involved. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, Professor Pierre, uh, would you suggest any more changes in the guidelines, considering we are four months down the, uh, down the, uh, from when we started? I, I, I think it's okay. You what is important okay? um, is to, to take care to, to, for any modification of the guidelines in terms of emergency. Because okay. Of course, in Africa, we have a huge problem, socioeconomic problems uh, yes. to face the uh, COVID pandemic. But the health problems are not so huge. The, what is huge in Africa as in terms of health problem is malaria, Ebola, uh, AIDS, and so on. Yes. And we, we did modi modify the guidelines. Okay. And then we have to take time to go. Of course, Africa is getting ready to welcome the vaccines. It's very important. And, but it's not uh, an opportunity to modify the, the guidelines them of emergencies. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you, thank Professor you. Pierre. Thank you, Professor Pierre. Uh, may I ask Professor Ian from uh, uh, Hong Kong? Professor Ian from University of Hong Kong? Hi. Uh, Professor Ian, uh, you've been listening to the discussions and I hope you've seen the guidelines uh, that was uh, probably sent to you. How is Hong Kong faring? And uh, uh, please let us, uh, tell us what is the role of uh, pharmacy, uh, the pharmacy workforce uh, with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I, I think some historical background about Hong Kong to start with, because um, 17 years ago, we have SARS, um, which is sort of like the, the other coronavirus. So the people in Hong Kong actually are very much better prepared for uh, pandemic than any other places. Our infection rate is something like one in a thousand, so it's very low and our death rate is extremely low too. Um, one of the very important things about pharmacists right at the beginning is because we were prepared in the circumstances of her. So um, for example, give you a very interesting example is we run out of the hand rub very rapidly, the sensitizer, because everyone know that they need the sensitizer. So, what happened is um, the people in my department, one of the pharmacists actually made a video in the YouTube to teach people how to actually make 
their own hand rub yeah. sensitizer even before the WHO did it. And it became a massive hit. It's about something like 50,000 people actually watch it and try to make it in their own home. So that, that is the bit that the pharmacists actually involved. And also the other thing is about the mask. It's, again, it's a very interesting differences between the West and the East. If you're looking into most of the Asian country, like you know, Hong Kong, uh, uh, Taiwan, China, we all use masks, everyone use it. Yes. Um, there is a very interesting I'm debate sure. about the believing on whether very mass is the right things or not. Pharmacists, again, it's, it's very, because a lot of mass actually was sold in pharmacy. So the pharmacists actually can explain why the mass is important. Yeah. Uh, understanding about what the mass can do. The mass actually yeah. is a prevention measurement to prevent other people got infected by you rather than prevent yourself to be infected by others. And, and there was a lot of information came out from our researcher in the university and then a lot of people, you know, whether the healthcare professionals, they can get involved in all those. Um, so, so that's some of the historical background. But in, another interesting thing is about the vaccine itself. The Hong Kong government is using similar strategy as the UK government. We have the contract with uh, German, the BioNTech, and also with the AstraZeneca, and also with another Chinese company. Simply is you can't put all your egg in one basket. Okay. And that is highly important in terms of the public health, pharmaceutical public health policy side of it. And secondly, it's about currently, there's no, no, I, I do not believe the pharmacist currently in any country can actually administer the COVID-19 wow. at the moment because it's only the Pfizer one is approved at the moment, which is has to be stored in minus 70. So it's no longer the manpower is a problem to administer the vaccine. It's the facilities is a problem. And that's why I think, uh, Rosine, you can tell us because the UK, we had our first dose on Monday. I'm in London, by the way. Um, so the, 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 the issue is not whether we have enough people to administer. It is to do the facilities. So Rosine, do you want to just give us a bit more background? And then I think the second, the second round would be to do the AstraZeneca one, but that will be the bit that we have to plan for pharmacists. Rosin? Okay. Yes, hi right. there. Yeah. Um, for those people who don't know you, I'm, I'm based in Belfast and I'm the president of the Guild of Healthcare Pharmacists across the UK. So um, thank you, Ian. Yes, I agree with you. We have a challenge. We have a lot of pharmacists and we have pharmacy technicians who are registered healthcare professionals across the UK who are very skilled workers who are able to um, at least draw up and facilitate the manipulation of this complex you, a vaccine, which is a multi-dose vial as well. And I think we're very used to these pre-fill syringes that we have for flu. And so this is completely different for the workforce. So our primary care population, so our GPs and practice-based nurses are very familiar with vaccination, as are many of our pharmacists, but they're very familiar with this pre-fill syringe which this is not. So this is a huge challenge, I think, for everyone. And, and you're right, Ian, I mean, we uh, pharmacists in the UK can be prescribers and we have a lot of prescribers. So there, there are lots of different mechanisms that we've looked at across the UK, thinking about whether it's a prescription for each patient, is it what's called a patient group direction? And I'm not sure if you have that across in other countries where we can then have somebody who's not a prescriber administer, but then there's issues with this as well. So yes, it's, it's thinking about making it safe and also finding out who is responsible. So in, in my organization, we, we, we provide insurance for our, our membership as well. So, so liability insurance. And so for a lot of our pharmacist members, a big concern for me is to make sure that whatever process we decide to follow, be it following a national direction, is it individual prescription, are they the prescriber? Are they administering against another prescription? Whatever happens that the patient is safe, of course, but also that they administer minister is safe as well so there's a whole load of stuff isn't there really around that Ian around making sure we get the right location we get the right you know is everybody trained appropriately is the patient getting a medicine that's actually viable because what we know from what you're talking about this the, the, the Pfizer vaccine is the one that we have at the minute and um, that that's available everywhere it's frozen of course and then you're not supposed to transport it unfrozen because it denatures so there's lots of chat about that so if we administer this in a you know, a primary care facility, which would be like a local, you know, GP practice, which is a, our local family doctor practice. 
how can it be transported there if you haven't got a freezer? So yes, this has been occupying a lot of time, as you can imagine, over the past week to figure out the right way to do it. So we have a lot of challenges. I think that some people have already mentioned that I think within a hospital trust, it's a, we can see it a lot more cleanly because we have freezers and we have a lot of healthcare professionals. We can have a prescriber present at all times. So that's maybe a bit easier to see. But when we think about mass vaccination across our population, particularly like um, Professor Saraf was saying, and also Professor Chen, where you're starting with, and uh, Professor Manasseh as well, your very elderly population who are in care homes, you know, we, we're, we're not going to bring them into the trust. We are obviously going to go to them. And that's what we've been doing. But we can't bring a freezer. So, you know, we, we have a lot of challenges right now. So there has been some vaccination started, but we have largely started with our healthcare staff. And we have done some of the, you know, close care homes to trusts um, where the, I think uh, Professor Manasseh was talking about um, dry ice and we have been using that as well. But yes, Ian, you're right. It's it's an ongoing challenge. As I'm speaking to you, I'm getting WhatsApps about what are we doing here? What are we doing there? So I think it's an evolving situation. And um, and, and, and I do think this is all the logistics that I think as, as pharmacists, we are very we are very interested in getting this detail right. So I think that, um, I think everyone has said this today, that we're absolutely the right people to be involved in this process because we we love a bit of minutiae, don't we? We love to get it right. And we love to get our protocols ready and straight. And I think that I think that we're gonna figure this out, but it, it is gonna take a little bit of time. Thank you. See, uh, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yes. Yeah, uh, I did happen to see how um, the storage of the Pfizer vaccine and how it has to be carefully, uh, uh, you know, um, you have to be careful about the storage conditions and the multiple layers that the vaccine itself has, uh, you know, so it looks like really a me uh, quite a bit of challenge actually when it comes to using that, uh, you know, just looking after the vaccine itself is a huge problem. Um, yes. But, uh, but uh, uh, my question is, uh, who? Uh, and I understand that each uh, vaccine has a tracking number. And uh, um, but it's not only really, we are talking not only really about one uh, dose; it's multiple doses, right? Yes. Probably two doses. So this whole uh, you really need uh, uh, good uh, systems in place when it comes to vaccine uh, vac uh, when using these kind of vaccines, other than the vaccines which are which do not require such, uh, you know, so much of care when it comes to, uh, the, you know, um, administering the vaccine. Now, um, just uh, so that what was, what is the role of uh, the pharmacists now or the pharmacy workforce uh, as of now when uh, for the, during the pandemic, what, what, what was their role? Across the UK? Yeah. Yeah, well, I suppose I'm, I'm responsible for a hospital pharmacist, so I can probably speak a little bit more about our, our teams as opposed to community practice. But I know that, and this is not to say that the community pharmacists haven't had an enormous role because they have across the whole pandemic. And they've been vital, really, because their doors have been open. They've been providing much needed health information to patients at the point of care. And also they've been available to, to discuss vaccine options as well, which has been fantastic. But from a hospital perspective, we've obviously had our patients in and I heard Professor Manasseh talking earlier as well about the impact on ICU. So I, I'm based in um, cardiology, that's my background. And we've had to, a lot of us have been retrained into ICU and we've been converting things like our, our canteen went in a couple of weeks transformed into a new ICU in our hospital. So to be prepared and ready for, for these patients coming in. So your role really as a hospital pharmacist has been whatever it's needed to be, I think. It's been trying to get ready to make sure we have enough medicines, to make sure we have everything that we need to treat the patients coming in the door. Really thinking about who are our high priority patients because not everybody ends up in ICU, not everybody is a candidate for an ICU unit. So a lot of our COVID patients, especially elderly patients, you know, didn't come into ICU, they were managed in other COVID wards. So um, the pharmacists have been involved in really everything. So we're, we're prescribers, we're um, 
um, obviously supporting patients thinking about their comorbid states. So other things that are happening um, within within cardiology, there's been, of course, I think about 20% of, of, of COVID patients that's been reported have arrhythmias. So there's been a lot of you know management of that. What does that look like? Long-term impact, for example, cardiovascularly. So I think that you know pharmacists have a role within all of that. And now here's another role, thinking about vaccination. So I think probably for about two weeks now, that's really been at the forefront, forefront really of everyone's mind in the UK and from a pharmacy perspective is doing this as safely as possible. So choosing the right way of getting the medicines into the patients to the right patients as well. So I know Professor Manana sh sh showed us earlier about the USA strategy. And I think that's similar to ours, especially for the first two sections, which is high, high, high risk healthcare workers. And we've divided up our healthcare workers. So for example, those working in ICU and our very front you know, frontline front line. workers are first, yeah. But then there, I mean, I maybe wouldn't be right in there. I'll be the, the second tier because I'm not actually mm. administering the vaccine. Well, I think I am actually this week. So maybe I will be vaccinated. But, and then, um, and then we have elderly care patients and then we're going to work our way down. I was interested to see Professor Manasseh that you had young people and children, you know, before the general population. And I don't think, somebody can maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we've had that in the UK that we're putting them before the German population. Ian, is that right? I haven't seen that. No, the, 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 all the evidence so far actually demonstrate the, uh, the children are actually the less likely to suffer from the major side effect. All the research yeah. so actually point out multi-mobility, elderly patient, by the way, also male, <laughs> uh, good outcome. So that's why um, um, the, the strategy of most of the, um, I, think, I suspect most of the public health strategy will go for that group first and also with the uh, healthcare worker. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Can, can I ask you, uh, Mary, uh, excuse me, um, we read, uh, we heard that the first few in UK, you had some allergic uh, 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 anaphylactic uh, reactions, isn't it, with the healthcare? Is this yeah. something that the pharmacists can... Uh, Will, will manage or are they trained or what, what's the role? Uh, just, just for my now, uh, because uh, that's an important uh, uh, issue that uh, we are now thinking in Australia, we just, uh, Timothy will know that that was mentioned here about allergy and those who are allergic, uh, have allergy should not uh, take this. Now I'm just thinking, what's the role? Uh, yeah, there was, there was, it was very public, wasn't it? It was publicly, I think it was like the first day we had two anaphylactic reactions. The, yeah. They were both healthcare workers, I think both female, as far as I remember, and they both had a history of food-related allergic reactions. There hasn't been a lot more information on that. So, I mean, we've looked into this, and I, again, somebody may correct me, but I suppose for me, I'm thinking, is there anything nut? Is there anything egg in the vaccine? But I can't see anything, unless anybody else has seen something that I haven't. So we're not really sure why these particular individuals have had this reaction. So I know that part of your immunization training and, and part of our training for those of us who are, are going to be vaccinating is, is to how to manage an, an allergic reaction. So we will have all of that ready. So wherever you are, there will be the, the, the immediate life support stuff, but then also you'll have, because I work in an, an acute trust, so it's very easy for us to then call for an arrest team. Um, and we, we have all of that set up within our clinics. But I do realize that, as Ian has said, community, a community well, exactly. Yes. That's going to be difficult, I think. Yes. And yeah, I think the, that's something they're working through. Yeah, my understanding is so far the two cases that they have severe anaphylactic shock are the people already on the EpiPen, i.e. the yes. adrenaline. They have to carry the adrenaline. So they means that they must have some sort of very severe reaction before. And, and I think one of the possibilities is because we are creating a massive antigen inside our body yeah. in order to trigger the response to the COVID-19 in the future, that probably triggered the immune response in, in a sort of like specific way. Mm -hmm. I suspect we're gonna learn far more later on. And uh, and one of the good thing is, okay, not, not the best, but it's because at the moment, all the immunization have to be done in acute trust or at least in a hospital with a visa can cope with minus 70. So effectively, they always have a casualty right next to them and, yeah. and actually give an extra layer of, of safety. Um, in, in terms of the flu vaccine in the past, that all the people that they can administer the flu vaccine in a community pharmacy, they must go through the training of deal with uh, anaphylaxis and also, so they should have an EpiPen with them or equipment, the things that they can administer. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Also a UCL person, that's why I know the UK so much. I know, if Mahendra was telling me earlier. Thank you. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you to both uh, Professor Ian and to Rosen.
Uh, I'd like to go to Professor Diego, Professor from Brazil. Professor Diego. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah. Professor, um, you weren't there in the previous webinars when these guidelines were co uh, you know, constituted. Um, I hope you have seen them and I, uh, you've gone through them. Uh, what are you, your views on it and would you like to add anything or subtract some things? Mm -hmm. Very good. First of all, thank you for Professor de Souza and esteemed panel colleagues um, for, the, for the invitation that you extended to me. Uh, to join this panel of UNESCO Chair in Bioethical Pharmacy. Um, before before I, I address those points, I would just say that in the, the context of Brazil, which I'm representing uh, today, the situation is quite similar to the one that uh, I've been hearing from uh, this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, in the fact, in the moment that we go through, uh, one of the profound challenges in terms of health and economy uh, and we are not only assessing the impact of the pandemic in the ethical concerns, but we are debating, qualifying and proposing strategies that can contribute, uh, I would say, for a more and a better access for health solutions, which is exactly what I, I truly believe. Brazil, uh, uh, I would say that everything that is proposed on the guidelines is very applicable uh, to Brazil. Brazil has more than 6 million of registered infections registered uh, and more than 170k deaths uh, that are also registered. As a, as a, I would say, a, a very holistic perspective, there is an approach to follow the guidelines of IPF. Uh, and basically those guidelines are just uh, stating uh, basically to, based on four principles to prepare, identify, to isolate, and to contain. And the Brazilian, uh, let's say, pharmacists are required by the governments in order to actively participate on that. And this is also the position of the, the Council of Pharmacy in the country. Um, the role of pharmacy in Brazil is uh, basically there is uh, around 100,000 uh, uh, drugstores in the country, more or less, and they are all the entry door uh, for the common citizen. And uh, it's quite a respectable uh, profession there, quite accessible to, to the patient and to the healthy subjects. Um, to assure the supply, we already discussed the supply here, but it's the, the role of the pharmacies and pharmacists is also to assure supply for each product, not only vaccine related, we will go over to that, but uh, the other types of products, because in this type of co time of COVID, ethical issues prompt not only for the COVID related products and therapies, but also to the non COVID related products and therapies okay. that okay. should supply it at the same rate or even more, more because people are confined. Uh, then the responsibility of the pharmacist of protecting uh, and not only his own, their own drugstore employees, but the health, the health of the population and, and basically the, the, the normal roles. Um, pharmacies are in Brazil are helping diagnosis, uh, notification of suspect cases, uh, even they were required to apply the flu vaccine and the overall pharmaceutical care and assistance uh, uh, as well. Hospitals on the, on the universal system of health are packed um, there has been some vaccine mistrust, I would say, in, in Brazil from different communities that they don't uh, trust the efficacy and the safety of uh, several types of vaccines due to the short term of developing. I think this issue is more worldwide as well uh, in some communities, uh, but uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, the, in terms of vaccine, uh, there has been a vaccine uh, level, uh, developed uh, in conjunction with the Butantan Institute in Brazil and the Chinese uh, uh, Sinovac. Uh, it's called Coronavac. It's uh, uh, right now in phase three. Um, and basically it's a, it's a multicentric uh, uh, trial with 16 centers and seven states in Brazil. Uh, preliminary, preliminary results uh, seem, uh, I would say, positive. The intention of the go government is to purchase 
around 46 million of doses and the intent of the government of the governor of Sao Paulo is to do the rollout of the program starting in the end of January. Um, but uh, I would say that it's still room to grow. But all the say the all the principles that nurture this uh, ethical guidance uh, fully apply. Uh, I would say in my experience in the country. I think. Uh... Uh, prof, uh, uh, Professor Mary is having um, some issues with her um, internet. Can I ask, uh, 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 doc, uh, what's this, Diego? What um, uh, you you've seen uh, the the draft guidelines that we are trying to going to be this we are part of it. Part of this is also to discuss this and look at. Uh, you know, it's applicability where we are trying to, this is, a, uh, a, the intention is it's an international um, guideline. So we wanted to see uh, from, uh, not just uh, from Brazil, but in, indeed um, Latin American, uh, what do you see? Do you see any, any, uh, it, it's applicability or do you, do you see any uh, uh, changes or additions that you need to bring in? No, I would say that so all are applicable, um, uh, in my opinion, uh, the general principles of autonomy, of mal non-maleficence, all of those are fully uh, applicable to regard to Latin America and, and specifically Brazil. So fully agree with, with those. Right. Okay, Derek, do you want to take me? Because we could uh, probably uh, need fact, to get there was uh, from... a question for Professor Henry, uh, which uh, was there earlier, and since uh, he may be leaving in some time, maybe he can address it. Uh, this whole problem of the cold chain, sir, this would definitely be a major issue for the developing countries, the poorer countries, and again, uh, they're always hit hard at every level where it comes to healthcare cover, vaccination. Uh, available of uh, technicians, qualified staff. So how can that be addressed in an ethical manner, looking at solidarity, justice, keeping all the principles in mind? Um, my apologies. Uh, I'm no, so we, sorry. We, that's okay. We, uh, we understood and I just continued. Yeah. We're just having... Yes, now, uh, now you can go ahead. No, but I think you you asked a question to Henry, isn't it? Yes. If, if yeah, you could I think just, embracing uh, the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, uh, notwithstanding the required ultra cold chain, uh, I think just provides an entree to the first access to vaccines that can be administered around the country that have the capacity to do the storage and the appropriate preparation. I agree with some of the other commentary that it will be unfeasible to uh, move the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines into other areas that yeah. don't have the capacity for ultra freezing. And I think in that sense, our, I think we all hope that the AstraZeneca vaccines, the Johnson and Johnson vaccines, some of the others coming down can be the next step of wider distribution. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Back to you, Dr. Mary. Thank you, uh, Derek. Uh, I'd, uh, Dr. Daniela is there? Dr. Daniela from Kenya? Yes, yes, yes. I'm here. Uh, Dr. Daniel, my apologies. I, 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 my net keeps going on and off. I, um, can you uh, tell us the perspective in Kenya about uh, what is the role of pharmacy and pharma, uh, uh, the pharmacy workforce um, in this COVID-19 pandemic? Are they being, uh, or is there a move uh, towards including them in the vaccination program? Okay. Um... Okay, so first I'll just give a brief of, of COVID in Kenya. 
so far we've had about uh, 91,000 confirmed cases and 1,500 deaths um, since May. So you would say uh, relatively not a very uh, bad picture. Um, but um, what has happened is uh, COVID uh, has exposed a lot of gaps in, in our health systems. Um, and, uh, and so we are, it has really put a lot of focus on one, the numbers of, of healthcare workers needed in the country. And then when you think about that, then you think, are there some unutilized or underutilized cadres? And pharmacists are always coming out as a highly underutilized healthcare cadre. So, so far, um, pharmacists have been playing a role in educating patients uh, because, of course, of the rush that came for certain medicines, uh, you know, azithromycin, dexamethasone, anything that's announced by a politician or a policymaker or, uh, you know, a citizen of the world on social media that it works, there was a very big rush uh, uh, for people just hoarding medicines. And so we have unofficially played that role of interacting, uh, directly interacting with, with patients and health seekers and um, advising them even on the type of uh, sanitizers to use on how to protect themselves, how to wear a mask, um, which masks, you know, are single use and, you know, and the pros and cons of different masks. And with this, even the professional association has been sending out a lot of uh, risk communication on, on our public channels. Um, but in terms of official recognition of, of what pharmacists can do, um, we, we still feel that pharmacists are still underutilized. We have not been um, enrolled in the testing, the national testing strategy. And then in terms of administering vaccines, um, uh, we, we can, well, the, the vaccine is not here already, but we can already um, uh, sort of benchmark on the existing um, uh, sub immunization services in pharmacy in Kenya, which is, is really a, at, at a low level. So we're not, um, we're not prepared right off school to administer uh, immunizations. It happens as a sort of a, like a in-service training for those who want um, like a, a two week training and you're certified and you can administer immunizations and most pharmacies uh, who, who do take this training uh, administer flu vaccines. Um, so we feel it's still a drop in the ocean, the number of pharmacists who can actually administer vaccines. And like I said, for us, because of health system gaps that are being exposed by this pandemic, we would rather um, focus, maybe not so much on just this pandemic, but how can we better prepare pharmacists to provide an expanded set of services right off the bat from when they leave school. And so we really need to, we need the cooperation of our academic institutions to prepare the pharmacists before, before they leave school. Um, Another role that uh, pharmacists have been playing uh, during this pandemic is also to, uh, particularly through the association, to sensitize the public um, about the need to go to an, a registered outlet. Uh, this is certainly a reality in some countries, maybe not so much the countries of the West. We have a lot of illegal outlets. Uh, you'll be shocked to know that there, there are more <laughs> than the ones run by uh, pharmacists or, or pharmacy technicians. So when we're talking about let pharmacists uh, get reimbursement uh, from insurance for services, let pharmacists be allowed to immunize. Um, we are very hard pressed to just to justify or to explain, you know, how these services will only be acquired through legal outlets. Um, how will we? Um, how, how will we self-regulate or how will we help government to ensure that people who are not authorized to administer these vaccines do not administer them? So I, I think really, you know, we, 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 we are really focusing on what we can do for COVID, but we're always just going back to health system strengthening and uh, better regulation and that kind of overarching um, policy and, and regulatory environment that will protect the patient. Um, in terms of the vaccine, we, we think we will get it, um, you know, early next year because we were one of the countries that participated in the trials for the Oxford University of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So we're happy about that because it's one of the vaccines that can easily fit into our supply chain and logistics uh, capabilities uh, because it just needs a uh, refrigeration. 
uh, we, our government has already assured us that they will roll out this vaccine through the, 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 the private, uh, sorry, the public uh, sector uh, infrastructure that, that they used to roll out even childhood vaccines. So it hasn't been made very clear what will be the role of community pharmacies, for instance, who are largely private sector. Uh, the focus right now in terms of preparation is uh, our public sector pharmacists who run the, the, the public hospital uh, pharmacies. Um, and uh, and we, we'll see how, well, we've, we've already been assured of 10 million doses through the, the WHO-led uh, COVAX facility uh, that Kenya will get 10 million free doses. But in terms of how the rest of the population will will get the vaccines, those ones who are willing to pay from their pocket that will probably want to get it from a pharmacy, that, that's not very clear. So I think that's, that's the summary I can give for Kenya. Um, Mary, are you all right? Was I being heard? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah you I, heard. yes, yes. yes. Yes, uh, for me partly, but thank you very much, uh, Daniela, for uh, telling us what is the situation in um, Kenya. Uh, I think uh, maybe we should take some questions in the chat box from the chat box from the panel of participants. Or is there any? Uh, do any of the panelists want to add on to what has been discussed right now? Uh, one thing I, I'd ask, Daniela, you've seen the guidelines. How? Uh, how? Uh, I mean. Does that apply to you to to Kenya? I know that uh, Peter uh, uh, Peter Effa was involved in this from from Africa, from Cameroon. So I, just from the Kenyan perspective, uh, mm -hmm. are, you, uh, are you are you any comments there to that uh, to what uh, the team under uh, the chairmanship of Henry um, have come up with? Yeah, I, I, I read it. Um, it was my first time interacting with them as I prepared for this webinar. I think they, they give uh, a very comprehensive uh, top level, you know, uh, guiding principles in terms of um, the ethics of um, uh, COVID-19 vaccination and other services. Um, I, think, I think that they serve as a good guide uh, for any service that will come um, probably that we already know of or some, you know, another service that will come later on uh, that will be provided through the pharmacy channel. So I, I don't really have anything to add. I think they're excellent guidelines. I would want to know when they're official um, so that I can share them uh, with pharmacists in Kenya through our association. Oh, lovely. I'll leave that to, to Henry to Henry, elaborate yeah. on that, yes. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. Derek, probably you should uh, give the views of the um, or the discussions that has been going on in the chat box. That would give everyone an idea of what is uh, what has been, you know, what is happening. Because not many would have seen the chat box. Yes, uh, Dr. Mary, and thank you everyone for uh, carrying on an active participation in the chat box uh, as well. Uh, as has been discussed and has come through, uh, it's not a very simple uh, formula. Yes, even if the vaccine is approved and available in the market, just the delivery and ensuring that it reaches the end stage is, appears to be a larger challenge. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's the USA or the UK or uh, even India or the whole of the African continent, as long as we don't uh, have this uh, feeling of solidarity, I think we'll be facing a bigger challenge in the years to come or even finding a solution. So the uh, net result appears to be, and what uh, I, I would feel is the consensus, is that again, we will have to look at a greater solidarity than we already had in facing the most acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic where countries should get together and not be in this race to buy off stocks available, ensure that our population is safe. In fact, every newspaper headline is, is um, mostly highlighting that, that we have booked so many doses and our population is safe. 
but uh, with world travel opening up and we've seen it in the past just one carrier or one person who is not vaccinated can create havoc for that country as well so we need to keep this in mind and and uh, governments and all those in healthcare administration need to keep this concept in mind that unless all of us are protected and all of us are safe we need to have the right information out there ensure that uh, whatever queries are whatever questions are they are answered with true scientific knowledge not just a few isolated incidents reported and again that whole parallel uh, thought of is the vaccine good should we take it or not even uh, i know among the healthcare professionals in our own country there's there's again a huge doubt nobody really is able to understand or have the confidence that should i go in for a vaccination or not even when it's available so these are the larger issues that we need to plan and i'm so grateful we have this panel and i'm sure that the discussion which comes out and and possibly a white paper or a draft guidelines that was already put in place will uh, go forward in a very long way in addressing the problems of the future and again the issue of uh, the pharmacist being it's not just simply being allowed or permitted or trained to administer the vaccine but the fact that they need training the system needs a backup to tackle any unfortunate or adverse event so these are very important issues that we need to keep in mind not just being able to administer the vaccine but to do it in a safe manner to do it in a manner that it reaches everyone in the shortest possible time and i think only then can we look at this whole program as achieving the end result that it was meant to be a doctor okay um very um, <laughs> well if you doctor mary if you're ready then i think we if you're coming to the end we will come back to henry for his last on where to from here yeah uh, just before that i'd like to uh, i like the comment which uh, professor richa has said uh, do not uh, lose faith in the whole process of uh, a vaccination because we've been waiting for it for a long time and now it's like you know we've all reached a fatigue point so i like that statement do not lose hope for that matter do not lose hope and have faith uh, in the health system and what Uh, the scientists are tr- uh, striving to eradicate this uh, virus um dr russell i, I think it yeah. might uh, professor henry to uh, yes. give his concluding I, remarks and probably additions to uh, to the already existing guidelines that was drafted one more comment before um, henry to um, summarize the I, i think we also need to uh, prepare the resurgence of the covid-19 after this vaccination because so far all the evidence suggests the covid-19 may come back in a year time and also because the antibodies in our body yeah, will continue to reduce and at that point there may be a huge opportunity for pharmacists to take the opportunity to be just like the flu vaccine that we've been doing in England for many years and also to manage the chronic disease management for all the period of time when people can't go out so i think we probably need to have a horizon scanning if we are going to have a guy like to come out thank you i think that's a good um, um comment because uh, even now we're not sure how long the immunity is going to last is that right henry we 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 don't have that uh, it's very quick we're not sure how long it will last whether we will need again boosted and whether the the other important thing is whether the uh, this so far this vac- uh, this uh, virus has been fairly stable unlike the influenza one where the mutation keeps changing and so we keep having to get new ones all the time so we don't know all this what will happen down the track but i suppose it's it's uh, it is a good all these are important uh, for our thoughts but i'd like to know Uh, we do have to at the end of this uh, and Henry is going to we're going to give this uh, to Catherine Dugan uh, a a a statement which is then going to take your guidelines out but uh, dr uh, professor henry uh, 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 your concluding uh, remarks in where to from here and so forth as the chair 
Well, uh, thank you for that opportunity. And uh, I think this has been a very rich conversation uh, that really informs and uh, I think strengthens this need for solidarity. Uh, I believe uh, Professor Effa actually recommended that we include solidarity as a fundamental ethical principle that we're all in this together and that uh, we simultaneously, given our talents and our strengths and our education, need to work together to help uh, mitigate uh, this particular virus. Having said that, um, the pharmacist workforce represents a significant investment in many of our countries. Uh, these are university educated people. Uh, these are people who have studied hard, uh, are quite bright. At least in my experience, I'm always impressed by uh, our students. Uh, and yet, uh, as we heard from uh, Dr. Danielle, uh, they are in many instances underutilized and in some senses maybe inappropriately utilized given the challenges of healthcare systems. Uh, my own view is I think the COVID pandemic provides a platform whereby the leadership in pharmacy practice and the leadership in pharmacy education can uh, come forward and advocate for a more effective utilization of the pharmacist in uh, working with our colleagues in medicine and nursing and public administration to, uh, to get a handle on this uh, horrible disease. So my hope is that uh, the work of UNESCO and uh, the collaboration, hopefully, that can come between UNESCO and FIT, that we can really empower uh, some of the things that we've said here uh, at the national level. Um, we need a infrastructure, if you will, to begin to uh, get this report into the hands of uh, our leaders throughout the world. And uh, my recommendation would be that uh, you know, serious discussion go on between UNESCO and FIP. Uh, there already is a uh, relationship between UNESCO and the Unit Twin Project program. Uh, that's a up and running program and has been for many years with FIP. Uh, but FIP will give us access to the national associations as well as individual members. Uh, I think we also, within FIP, need to work with the educational leadership community. Uh, there is a uh, Dean's group and an educational initiative within FIP that gathers up uh, our academic leaders because training and education is crucial here and uh, our universities need to step up uh, to include these critical public health roles for pharmacists. And uh, again, I think Catherine Duggan can help us. The last recommendation that I would make is that uh, you know, clearly as these vaccines are rolled out, uh, we obviously have to find a good match between the characteristics of the vaccine and national need. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe as vaccine development continues to move along, our respective countries have to be clear about some of their healthcare system challenges for which vaccine development might become sensitive. Uh, even refrigeration is difficult in some parts of our world and uh, whether we could develop a vaccine that would be stable without refrigerator. I, I don't know enough about the science to be able to speculate, but it should be on the agenda, right? So that we can enhance uh, the access to the medicines. So again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of these thoughts. Um, we will uh, likely be appreciative of any comments that anyone might have about the guidelines so that we can strengthen them and uh, move toward finalizing and getting them distributed. So again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all this morning. And I thank you for uh, your commitments. 
Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And so we will uh, uh, come up uh, uh, with, uh, with, as Catherine, uh, Professor Catherine Dugan wanted at the end of this to make a statement that uh, we will then um, um, have uh, 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 Dr. Catherine, Professor Catherine Dugan take this across uh, with the International Pharmaceutical Federation, which I think as Henry has advised, and she is coming to the, I mean, that's her discussion with, uh, with Mahendra and myself. So we will take that um, uh, trajectory or that road uh, to take this out. And we will, as Dr. Salindra said, once this is sent out, uh, that's a large, all the, uh, the national pharmaceutical uh, councils as we have the Indian, I'm sorry, pharmacy council uh, uh, and so forth will, will, will try to bring this in. And importantly, this is probably a, a great opportunity that we have um, some, um, colleagues, pharmacy discipline, uh, seniors, experts from around the world, from every continent and every region that have contributed in part uh, to the discussion, to the conversation, and indeed to pinning down those guidelines. And so I think this will be something that uh, we have contributed that comes out of this uh, um, uh, the, the pandemic that all of us in the world are together trying to transcend. And I liked what uh, uh, Richard and Dr. Mary brought. Uh, we've always, this all these uh, webinars have signified hope uh, that we are going to come out of this and we can all see uh, you know that's that's what we can we are we are beginning to see uh, the end of the tunnel by these vaccines and so forth. I'm sure we'll have, as uh, Ian uh, has said, you'll have some um, 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 new some more um, third waves or fourth waves or fifth waves and so forth. It'll come and go, and then. Uh, but one one important thing is that it has brought us together. It has brought. A lot of opportunities, new way of thinking. Even uh, this very webinar, where we have me, or us from uh, Tim, Timothy, myself, uh, uh, and um, um, there's out here at 12:30. It's already all, already the next day, isn't it, Tim? Uh, for 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 us, and we have Henry starting his day at 5:30 in the morning in. In, in, in Chicago, in the United States. And between the two, two of uh, these two extremes, we have all of you uh, uh, together coming. And that's another uh, example of what the pandemic has brought and taught us. So the solidarity that comes through this. So let me um, uh, now thank all of you. Thank uh, our moderator, Dr. Mary Matthew, uh, Professor Mary Matthew and Professor uh, Derek D'Souza uh, for um, their co contribution here, Professor Henry, and uh, um, for his continuous, uh, a lot of effort he put into it with Dr. Richa, Risha, and of course, Dr. Sailendra and, and all of you here. So a big thanks, and Professor Amman Kami, uh, uh, we're very great, thankful to you, uh, Professor, uh, for being there with us. He's the uh, the uh, the uh, UNESCO chair and is the head and shareholder. So uh, we are very grateful, and uh, it's also an implication of how important this is that he has um, attended this to see us come out with this, um, you know, a deliberation that makes we, we make a mark that we have contributed to to this, and I think we'll we'll continue with this. So once again. Uh, uh, thank you to, uh, to all of you, and uh, till we meet again, uh, we'll stay safe and stay well. Uh, we'll be having, uh, we'll keep you informed, you're in our list, and I'll be with all of you, uh, Roshin and uh, Daniel and Diego and uh, the uh, who have joined us in this, uh, we, we certainly will uh, be in touch and have consolidate all of you along with uh, our period and uh, uh, and and uh, the Timothy and and uh, Henry and Mahindra and uh, Sailindra and Suresh, who is not here at the moment but is with us uh, there. Uh, I also want to welcome 
Deborah from uh, Brazil. She's she always comes in and very nice to see you, Deborah. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us. Okay, uh, so we shall uh, thank all of you and we shall stay safe and stay well. Okay, thank you all. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. It's, a, thank it's you. a pleasure for us. Thank mm -hmm. you, Dr. Mary. Dr. Thank Derek. you, Deborah. Thank yes. you, Deborah. Thank, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very good for us to mm. assist the webinars. Thank you, Professor Diego. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Professor Diego, thank you very much for joining thank us. You, we'll be, I'll be in touch with you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Professor Russo, is Dr. Derek your brother? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's a, can't you see we are brothers here? I, I, I thought you were going to say he's my son. <laughs> By <Good> your son. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he, he's your brother. <laughs> Yes, we're brothers. Okay. <laughs> uh, Pire, thank you for joining. Uh, wow. uh, 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 thank you very oh, much brother. for joining, joining us, and uh, 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 and and also your contribution to the uh, to this document and to what we're trying to bring out. Thank you. Okay, I'm very worried here. Uh, people are not saying the same things. It's very complicated to, to organize the vaccine here. It's a larger country with politician, difficult politician. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I hope you are, you are getting better. <laughs> yes. Okay. We, a lot of hope. For that. Goodbye. Richard and, and Mary Burton, yeah. Okay, thank you, Richard, also thank for you. your thank you, contribution. Everyone. Thank you. Okay, Derek, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, no, no problem. So well done. Yes, this was really good.